In the next portion of this lecture, we'll talk about how we can actually get behavioral cloning to work in practice. All right, so uh, what is the problem of behavioral cloning? If we understand that problem, maybe we can get some idea of how to make things work better. Well, we can formalize this compounding errors problem as a problem of distributional shift. So our policy represents some distribution, pi theta at given ot. Now, if uh, everything was iid and at didn't actually influence ot plus 1, there would be no problem. But because ot plus 1 depends on at, if pi theta at given ot is not exactly the same as the action distribution uh, that collected the data, basically the policy of the expert human uh, driver, then the problem that we'll have is that the distribution over observations, p data ot, which is influenced by previous actions, will deviate from the distribution over observations that we get when we actually run our policy. So we train our policy on p data ot, but when we run it, we'll start getting observations from p pi theta ot, right? Our actions influence future observations, so our distribution over observations is different. It's the observation distribution for our new policy rather than the observation distribution of the expert human who generated the training data. So the problem is that p data ot is not the same as p pi theta ot. It is the problem of distributional shift. Now, this problem occurs because pi theta at given ot, even for a model that is trained well, will in general not be the same as uh, the human's distribution of our actions given their observations. However, what this implies, uh, well, first, let me just uh, uh, walk you through uh, the, uh, the analogy of this to another problem that we saw earlier. So uh, this problem of distributional shift is basically the same problem that we saw earlier when we, talk about, when we talked about recurrent neural nets. So if, we were, if you remember, what we talked about is how if your recurrent neural net makes a small mistake early on in the decoding process, so maybe uh, it selects an unlikely but possible mistake, and then conditions the next time step on that uh, chosen token, the mistakes might, might compound because even though that early mistake might be small and innocuous, it results in an input to the next time step that is unlike any input that, that network saw during training. So if we got unlucky, but now the model is completely confused about what's going on because it's such an unfamiliar input. And then it would make an even uh, worse uh, mistake later on. So the problem that we saw here with RNNs is a training, was a training test discrepancy. The network always saw true sequences as inputs at training time, but at test time, it gets its own inputs. It gets its inputs its own potentially incorrect predictions. The case in behavior cloning is very similar. Uh, during training time, the network only saw observations from the expert's observation distribution, but at test time, it starts seeing observations that are the consequence of its own, perhaps slightly incorrect actions. Now, this is called distributional shift, because the input distribution shifts from the true strings at training to synthetic strings at test time for the RNN, and equivalently, the observation shifts from the expert's uh, observations at training time to the policy's own observations at test time. This is a distributional shift. So it's the same problem. Now, we did have a prospective solution for this problem uh, when we talked about RNNs, and that was scheduled sampling. In scheduled sampling, during training, we actually feed as input the network's own previous predictions with some random probability. So instead of always training on the true sequences, we sometimes train on the network's own predictions. So we could ask, well, could we develop a version of scheduled sampling that works for imitation learning? We could actually take the predicted action from the policy, AT, and observe uh, what the resulting next observation is. And then we would know uh, what that observation would be, and we could feed it to the network. The problem is that while this was very easy to do for, for RNNs, it's actually very difficult to do in the case of imitation learning, because this requires actually interacting with the world. We don't know a priori what the observation what observation will result from taking some other action. You just have a video of a car driving along with steering commands. You don't know what the car would have seen if it took a different action. With the RNN, it's easy because the RNN is entirely simulated. It's entirely running inside the computer. But with the, the control problem, there's also the physical world. And without actually taking a different action in the physical world, you can't know what observation would have resulted from that. 
Uh, more formally, it's because you don't know the transition probabilities. You don't know the probability of the next state given the current state in action. You don't, know the prob you don't know the probability of the observation given the state, and therefore you don't know the probability of the next observation given the previous observation and action. These are unknown to you. You can get the samples from them by actually interacting with the world, but you don't know what those probabilities are uh, in, in a computer, and therefore uh, you can't easily simulate the observation you would get from taking a different action. Now, there are algorithms that attempt to learn these probabilities. They're called model-based reinforcement learning algorithms, and there's one way to overcome the problem. But for now, for imitation learning, we want to keep it simple. We want to be able to just train those continents to map images to driving commands without all the fuss of learning any other components. So, could we do that? Can we maybe, instead of fully solving the problem, can we just somehow mitigate it? Well, one thought here is the problem can be mitigated if pi theta at given ot is very accurate, meaning that it is very, very similar to the expert's true action distribution. Now, that is a very high bar. You need a very good policy for this to be true. But if your policy is very, very good, maybe the distributional shift will be minimal. Maybe p data ot will be approximately equal to p theta of ot. In practice, this sometimes works, and it tends to work better when your data set is very, very large. Essentially, if p data of ot is very broad, it covers a huge range of different observations, and your policy fits the data really, really well, and it generalizes really, really well, then in theory the problem still occurs, but in practice it can be very mild. So what we need to do is we need to collect huge amounts of data, and we need a very good way to train our policy. All right, so collecting huge amounts of data, there's kind of not much to be said about that. That's why that NVIDIA car needed to drive 3,000 miles. But how can we get a, a more accurate model? Well, to start thinking about how we can get a more accurate model, pi theta, we could ask, why might we fail to fit the expert? What are, what are some possible causes for mistakes? And there are two really big causes. One is non-Markovian behavior, and the other is multimodal behavior. And I'll explain what each of these means shortly. Non-Markovian behavior refers to the following situation. You're learning a policy pi theta of at given ot. This implicitly assumes that the action only depends on the current observation. Like the way the person is storing the steering wheel depends only on what they're seeing right now and not on anything else. It's the same as saying that if we see the same thing twice, we do the same thing twice, regardless of what happened before. But of course, this is very unnatural for humans. Think if you're turning left, you might keep turning left. If you're turning right, you might keep turning right. You don't make completely independent decisions at every point in time. You know, partly it's due to the mechanics of your car. Partly it's due to the mechanics of your brain. Right? Your brain uh, that doesn't instantaneously make feed forward independent decisions at every instant in time, it itself is governed by continuous processes. People have emotions. They make mistakes. Maybe this driver is annoyed, so they're driving more aggressively. Uh, their annoyance is not due to what they're seeing now. Maybe it's due to the fact that someone cut them off three minutes ago. In general, human behavior is not Markovian. It's not independent at every point in time. So a more accurate model that represents how humans actually behave is that their action might depend on everything that has happened so far. It might depend on all past observations. How could we train a model uh, that predicts an action at time step t conditional on all observations from time step 1 to t? What kind of neural network architecture could we use for this? Take a moment to think about that. What kind of architecture could read in a sequence of images and then predict the current action. Well, so this is a classic example of one of those many-to-one RNN architectures. Uh, so essentially, we need to read in the full, the full history of images, but reading that into a standard feedforward convnet is impractical because we have a variable number of frames and too many weights. So what we would do is we would design some kind of recurrent neural network with a convolutional encoder. So at every time step, we have a convnet with the same weights, read in the image, and produce some uh, little vector representation. And the vector representation goes into an RNN, or more generally an LSTM, 
And in the last time step, we have a little network that looks at the last LSTM state and predicts the action. So this is another really good place to use an RNN. We're, we're essentially using the RNN to model the fact that human uh, drivers, in this case, are non-Markovian, that their behavior depends on what they saw in the past. Right, so we would share the weights for the convent encoder, and then for the RNN state, typically we would use something like an LSTM cell. Although we could also use a transformer, that would be perfectly reasonable. All right, um, so that's non-Markovian behavior. Let's talk about multimodal behavior next. So here's a, a peculiar challenge. Uh, let's say that we are controlling a drone that is flying in a forest, and maybe it needs to fly around a tree. And it's okay to fly around the tree going left, and it's okay to fly around the tree going right. Uh, but of course, it's not okay to fly straight. And let's say that our actions are continuous. So we're solving a regression problem. We're, we're regressing onto continuous valued actions that determine whether we turn left or right. Um, now, in some settings, this is perfectly fine. So if we discretize our action, and we turn it into a discrete categorical label, and then we use a uh, softmax to predict the distribution over that label, it's entirely possible for the softmax to capture the fact that a left turn has a 50% probability and a right turn has a 50% probability, but going straight has a probability of zero. However, if we use something like a uh, mean squared error loss to actually output the continuous valued action, we might have a problem because half our data will be saying to go left and half our data will be saying to go right, so the mean squared error loss will actually average out the difference. Right? Going left is okay, going right is okay, but taking the average of the two is decidedly not okay. So there are a few solutions we would have. Uh, you know, we could simply discretize and use a softmax. That is a very reasonable choice for low dimensional actions. But if you have high dimensional actions, maybe instead of controlling the direction of the drone, you directly control the uh, uh, voltages on all of its motors or something. Uh, if you have high dimensional actions, it's very difficult to discretize because the number of discrete bins that you need goes up exponentially with the dimensionality of the action. So there are a few choices that we have for handling multimodal behavior. We could, for example, output a mixture of Gaussians. We could actually output multiple Gaussians, multiple values with uh, means, variances, and weights. We could look at latent variable models, and we could look at autoregressive discretization. Now, I will describe these concepts at a very high level in this lecture, very briefly. So don't worry uh, if um, you don't feel like you understand it deeply enough to actually implement it. We'll talk about things like latent variable models a lot more in a subsequent lecture after spring break when we discuss generative models. For now, I just want to introduce these concepts to you just so you know what they are, and so that if you do have to implement it, you know what kind of keywords to search for to get a more in-depth tutorial. So I'm going to cover all three of these, but very, very briefly. Don't worry if it's too high level uh, for you to be able to implement it for now. Okay, so mixture of Gaussians. This is probably the simplest one, but also in many cases the least effective. Now, the idea is that instead of outputting a single value with mean squared error, you will actually output the mean, variance, and weight for uh, each of n possible Gaussian mixture elements. So many of you probably learned about Gaussian mixture models in uh, something like CS189. Here, we have a conditional Gaussian mixture model. So conventionally, a Gaussian mixture model uh, just has a bunch of means, a bunch of variances, and a bunch of Ws, a bunch of weights on the mixture elements, but it's not dependent on anything. Here, the Gaussian mixture itself actually depends on the input image. So for different images, you get a different Gaussian mixture model. In the example of flying around the tree, you might expect that if you see a tree in front of you, you will have one mixture element that says fly left, another one that says fly right. But if you don't see a tree, maybe both mixture elements say go straight. So the, the mu's, sigmas, and w's depend on your image. How do we actually implement that? Well, we implement it so they're all outputs of your neural network. So your neural network, maybe it's a convnet that takes in an image and it outputs each of those things. So it has many different heads, each of which outputs a mu, a sigma, and a w. And the way that you train it is that you just write down the, uh, likely, the, the likelihood under the Gaussian mixture and you take the logarithm of that. 
It's a bit nasty because you're taking the logarithm of a sum, but it's okay, and you can implement it in PyTorch or TensorFlow, and PyTorch or TensorFlow will readily differentiate that. You literally just code up the formula for the log probability of a Gaussian. Um, well, you code up the formula for the probability of a Gaussian, multiply by the weight, sum it over all the mixture elements, and then take the log of that. Uh, by the way, what's wrong with a, with a mixture of Gaussians representation? Well, what's wrong with it is that in very high dimensional spaces, it's very inefficient. So in general, in high dimensional spaces, um, it's, you know, it's not as bad as discretizing everything, but in general, you still might need an exponentially large number of Gaussian elements to approximate an arbitrarily complex high dimensional distribution. You're essentially approximating a complex high dimensional distribution, which might have exponentially many peaks with a small number of peaks, maybe 16 or 32. And that might just not end up being a good approximation. So it's fine for flying around the tree, but if you have high dimensional spaces, uh, then you might still have some of these averaging effects that will trip you up. Latent variable models are a somewhat more sophisticated way to get very complex multimodal output distributions. The idea in latent variable models is that instead of changing the output of the network, we'll actually change the input. So here's how we can think about it. The reason that you chose to fly around the tree left versus right is due to some other piece of information that is not contained in the image. Maybe it's like, today you're feeling like going left. Tomorrow you're feeling like going right. Your feelings are a kind of latent, unobserved variable. You don't know what that variable was in the training data. So what you could do is you could design your neural network so that it takes in the current image and an additional vector that represents these unknown variables. And at test time, you might sample that variable randomly, right? Because at test time, uh, you know, the, the policy is controlling the robot. So if you were feeling like going left or you, or, or you were feeling like going right, the robot can decide for itself and just randomly sample its feelings. The tricky part about these latent variable models is figuring out what the latent variable should be at training time. Because at training time, you didn't know whether someone had like a left a uh, going left day or a going right day, so you have to guess these latent variables for your training data. I'm not going to describe how to do this, but there are a number of approaches to doing this effectively. So if you just naively give no, like a, a random noise input to your network, it won't use that random noise. But if you're careful in how you handle the training data, you can actually get it to use it. So um, this can be done with things like conditional variational autoencoders, and we'll actually discuss variational autoencoders after spring break. It can be done using something like normalizing flow, also called real NVP, and we'll discuss this after spring break also, as well as something like Stein variational gradient descent. We won't cover that in this class, but you might see this in a more advanced deep learning class at some point. So we'll cover some models that can train these latent variables effectively, uh, and then it'll be a little more obvious how this can work. But if you want to implement something like this right now, look up, I recommend looking up conditional variational autoencoder or normalizing flow slash real NVP. The third way of uh, representing multimodal distributions, and this is often actually the most effective, but it's a little complicated, is to use something called an autoregressive discretization. The intuition here is that discretizing your action works really well if you can do it, right? Because the softmax has no problem representing multimodal distributions. The problem is that if your action is very high dimensional and you try to discretize it, you might get exponentially many bins, exponential in the dimensionality of the action, and therefore it can be completely intractable to actually use this discretization. So the idea behind an autoregressive discretization is that instead of discretizing the whole action space, what we'll actually do is we'll discretize one dimension at a time. So if our action has, let's say, five dimensions, we'll take the first dimension and we'll discretize it into n bins, and we will have a uh, softmax over those n bins. And then, uh, we'll, you know, at test time, we'll sample from that softmax, and that gives us the value of the first action. And we feed that, that sample into another network that outputs a distribution over the second dimension, and then we sample from that, and so on. This is very similar conceptually to how we sample sentences from an RNN language model. Right? In an RNN language model, we, we sample one word at a time, and we condition the next word's distribution on the first word, and we condition the third word's distribution on the first and second word through recurrent connections. This is exactly the same idea, only now, instead of tokens corresponding to different words in a sentence, 
tokens correspond to different dimensions in an action vector. So, in fact, you can actually implement this with a conditional RN decoder exactly the same way that we implemented those seek-to-seek -seek models. So, now you have an image that goes in, encoded through a component, forms the first hidden state of an RNN that's used to generate a sample of the first uh, dimension of the action, then the RNN goes to the second time step, generates a second sample using the first one as an input, and repeats. Before we had tokens corresponding to words in a sentence, now we have tokens corresponding to discrete bins for each dimension of the action. And this is a very powerful idea because it doesn't require messing around with latent variables, and it can still represent very, very complex distributions. Downsides? Well, sampling from this is easy. Taking the max requires beam search, which you probably don't want to do when you're driving a car because it's a little slow, but sampling is totally fine. And it's very easy to train. All right. Um, now, that said, as I mentioned before, this is a fairly high-level discussion. We'll learn more about better ways to model multimodal distributions when we cover generative models later. So this is a high-level discussion. Don't worry uh, if at this point you don't feel like you have everything needed to implement this. We'll talk about these ideas a lot more after spring break. Okay. Um, but now, just to, to wrap up this part of the lecture, what I want to mention to you is the particular method that was actually employed in this work by NVIDIA to get this imitation learning driving method to actually succeed. And um, it wasn't actually quite as uh, sophisticated in any of the things I described. In fact, it was a little bit of a hack. But I think this hack is, is illustrative in the sense that it gives us a taste for the kinds of things that people often need to do to get behavior cloning to work in practice. So if we look at the um, system diagram in that NVIDIA paper, we'll see this. You have a steering wheel, um, uh, you know, it's adjusted for shift and rotation, okay, whatever that means. Um, you have your cameras, the, con the cameras go into a convnet, the convnet produces a computed steering command. That all seems kind of reasonable. But something that's a little bit mysterious is there's like a left camera, a center camera, and a right camera. What's up with that? Well, it turns out that this part is actually really important. Um, so what they actually did they didn't do something fancy like implement an RNN or multimodal prediction. They instead put three cameras on the car. One camera looks straight, and its images are labeled with the actual steering command taken by the driver. Another camera looks to the left, and its image is labeled with the steering command taken by the driver plus a small right turn. And the reason for this is that when the vehicle starts veering to the left, it'll see images from the forward camera that are more similar to those that were seen from the left camera in training. And since those images from the left camera were labeled with right turns, this will get the vehicle to correct the veering and go back to the center. And similarly, the images from the camera point to the right were labeled with the driving command plus a small left turn. So what this essentially does is it gets the vehicle to compensate for those small errors. So you still get the distributional shift but the effect of the distribution shift is mitigated because, in effect, you get the synthetic data augmentation that uh, actually does provide you with training examples that look like the sort of mistakes that you are likely to make at test time. Now, of course, this is a, a bit of a hack because this is you know, quite specific to driving a car. It's quite specific to turning left and right. If, for example, you were flying an airplane, it would be less obvious how to do this. But it does end up working fairly well. And um, you know, this gets at an important point that I want to mention in the summary. Behavior cloning in principle should not work because of the distribution mismatch problem. In practice, it sometimes works very well, especially if we use some hacks, like that trick with the left and right images. The problem is that which hack is needed to make it work in your setting is very application dependent. It depends on your domain. Now, besides using hacks, you can also use better models, like models with memory, those RNNs, or better distribution modeling with those tricks I described for representing multimodal distributions. And those will also help. Uh, and generally, if you take care to get really high accuracy, however you do it, uh, you can get behavior cloning to work better. But uh, don't be frustrated if you try behavior cloning and it doesn't work, because in principle it should not work, and it often requires a fair bit of trickery, especially in complex uh, domains where there's a lot of potential to make mistakes. So in the next part of the lecture, we'll actually describe a more principled approach, which we can sometimes use to overcome these issues.